Hey, welcome back, folks. Welcome back to the Outpost. Um, you might notice we got some different maps up behind me today because we're going to talk about a waterway or a body of water. I'm going to do a bunch of these highlights on different lakes, rivers, places I've been, help you understand where you're at, what to expect, and things to do on those bodies of water. Today we're going to talk about the Yawk, Yawk, the Yawk, in short, Yawkiogany, Yawkiogany River. Um, you live western PA, you learn the slang, and you, and you just sort of just slug through it. Yawkiogany, a um, little history on that. That's actually an Algonquin term or name, and I think it means something to the effect flowing in a contrary direction. I don't know where they got how that, that came to be, maybe because it actually flows north. So we'll talk a little bit where it starts, where it goes, and what you can do on that river. Um, basically, the headwaters is located in West Virginia. It's down where the panhandle of, well, the panhandle of Maryland meets West Virginia, um, near the highest point in Maryland. And here's an interesting little fact. The highest point in Maryland is actually higher than the highest point in Pennsylvania, if you didn't know that. But they beat us just by maybe about 30, 60 feet, something like that. Oh, well. All right, from there it heads north, and it crisscrosses the West Virginia-Maryland border, where it eventually ends up into Maryland. And it meets up, really comes near, um, it comes near Deep Creek Lake, where it gets some additional water. And it goes through a nice little uh, state park area, Swallow Falls. They got some nice waterfalls, some nice hiking. Been there, it's a nice place. Um, and then it flows, continues northward. And with that additional water and a nice ca um, canyon in Maryland, if you've ever heard the term Upper Yawk, that is where that is located. It's just across the border in Maryland there. And it, it feeds down to, I think, it, it, it take out somewhere around Friendsville. Um, that is more aggressive white water. We're talking class three, four, I think uh, maybe even five. I've never floated it, but several of the outfitters in Ohio Pile, which I'll touch on here in a little bit, they do offer rides there, floats there on the Upper Yawk. It's called the Upper Yawk. If you ever look through your brochures, you'll see terms lower, middle, upper. We'll cover all those today, but the Upper Yawk sits in Maryland. Um, from there, it goes into, not far, it starts flowing into Yawk Lake. Yawk Lake straddles the Pennsylvania Maryland border it is a what we call a um, uh, Corps of Engineers dam Army Corps of Engineers they build it for flood control purposes so but there is a lot of recreation on there a lot of people have houses around it there's a lot of recreational boating one thing to note about Army Corps of Engineers lakes is they're normally unlimited horsepower so if you're going on there with a small boat or a kayak, be very aware of that. They're going to be hammering around that lake. There'll be water skiing, tubing, that kind of activities. Um, not like many of your lakes in Pennsylvania where you're restricted to 20 horsepower. It's unlimited. It does, there's a lot of fishing opportunities on there because of the Yawk River itself. A lot of smallmouth in that lake. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other species. I'm sure you can find largemouth, pike. Um, I'm not too familiar with it. I've only fished it once as a tournament in the fall. Where What they do is come fall in preparation for winter and the anticipation for a lot of snow and melting runoff. They will lower the lake. And when I mean lower, they lower it by at least 50 foot or so. Um, it's pretty cool to see. I, in the past, they've actually lowered it so low that there is a... Somewhere where Route 40 crosses it, there's a little town there that existed before they flooded it, and you could see the remnants of the town. That's one of those things. It would be pretty cool to see. I've never seen it yet, but it's there. So that's something to check out. All right. So when it empties out of there, now we start hitting a lot of recreational parts of the river. Where it empties out, it comes out of the outflow and goes right into a little small town confluence. And why they call it confluence is where the Yawk meets up with a couple other streams and rivers. It meets up with uh, Laurel Hill Creek, which is a really nice trout fishing creek stream. 
in the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania, and also meets up with the Castleman River. <clears throat> the Castleman River is actually, maybe I'll touch on that in another video, it's not an easy one to float, for one thing, but and it doesn't get fished very hard, and there is some good smallmouth fishing in that river if you can get to it. Good way to do that is the Great Allegheny Passage, which is another thing that meets up with the Allegheny River in confluence. The Great Allegheny Passage is a rails a trail that runs from Pittsburgh to Cumberland, Maryland. Um, if you're into bike riding, I highly recommend it. We'll do another video on that, I think, because um, I, I got a lot of experience on that bike trail. But that meets up in there, and it parallels the Yawk all the way until the Yawk basically empties into the Monongahela River down in, towards Pittsburgh. All right, so from Confluence, we're floating downstream now, Confluence to the town of Ohio Pile. If you're big in the outdoors, if you live in western PA, if you live in the Laurel Highlands, you know Ohio Pile. Ohio Pile is a, a big central location for outdoor activity. We'll touch on that briefly here shortly. Um, again, another opportunity for a video. But, um, yeah, the Middle Yawk uh, is really where a lot of recreational boating starts. That section is more or less Class 1, Class 2, maybe Class 3, depending on water levels, depending on the releases coming out of the lake. Uh, I've floated it once with they wanted a rafting companies as part of a family trip our kids were younger they were in their let me put it this way our kids were in their young teens um, when we floated it they weren't real impressed with it it was rather boring for them even though you hit some rapids at the beginning and you wrap it and hit some rapids in it at the end i should say i i i misspoke there because i floated it twice the second time i floated it i actually did a intro to whitewater kayaking course and that was probably the the point in my life I realized I'll pursue kayak fishing over whitewater kayaking um, it, I, I realized I'm not real comfortable with being upside down in a kayak so um, yeah after a nice roll on that that one of the rapids I realized yeah I'll move on I'm, a, I'm not that high speed I don't need that I'll stick to rafts if I'm doing whitewater rafting or rafting, I'll do it in a raft. Um, but kayaks, I mean, my fishing kayaks, I probably had them through some class twos easily, maybe a class three somewhere along the line. Always felt comfortable in that. But as far as the actual short ones, forget that. Yeah, I'll pass on that for now. So, um, the middle yawk, all it does. There's definitely an opportunity. There's small mouth in there because what you got is when you got the the Casman coming in, it's normally warmer water, especially in the summer. Castleman and Laurel Hill Creek and then the Yawk being coming from the outflow from the lake you, it's drawing water from the bottom of the lake it's colder so you have a convergence of two water temps there so in the beginning at the very least the right side of the river is probably more small smallmouth habitat and the left side is more trout habitat um, the, the put in when you do, most people float it. They put in what they call Ramcat, and it's right above Ramcat Rapids of the same name. There's a series of rapids there that are probably class two in that area. Um, in the summertime, I've seen people put in Ramcat, float down through them rapids, take their kayaks out, walk the bike trail back to Ramcat, and float down again. You'll see that. Otherwise, people are putting in and floating the whole way down. I don't know if you need a permit from the state park to float that. It's something worth checking. Although there's plenty of parking right there because people park there for the biking and for the floating and stuff. And that's where all the outfitters put in whenever they're doing float trips in that area. Um, if you've never fished it before, um, for sure you could ride the bike trail and you could do some wade fishing. Stuff floating around here. Um, or if you float it, another option is there is a guide service down that way. I know they float in that general area. They are the Laurel Highlands Guide Services. They actually have them float boats that you can see when uh, when they're doing out west or something like that. They're long, long sloping boats. 
it, I think they do both fly fishing and regular um, conventional fishing out of those. Uh, targeting primarily either smallmouth or, or trout. Trout, I, I think they stock that part of the river. I'm not 100% sure, but even on, if they don't, there's a lot of holdovers in there and some big holdovers. Big holdovers. I mean, 20 inch fish. Um, if you go on Laurel Highlands Guide Services website, you'll see some of the pictures that are, are caught up there. So it's definitely worth looking at. Um, if you've been on the water a considerable amount with rivers and that, me, myself, I'd feel comfortable floating that section of the river on my kayak. Um, I would I would definitely study it a little bit to understand where the b bigger rapids are and the best, you know, where you need to be, whether it's going to be river left, river right, because it, the rapids right at the beginning and then right at the end, those are probably going to be your largest rapids you encounter. You take out in the town of Ohio Pow, right at the top end of Ohio Pow. There's a big parking area there. Um, right by the old train station, which I use as a visitor center, that runs, it sits right along the gap. Um, there's a big parking area, and right at the top end of that parking area is the takeout for the river. That gives you some idea where that's at. So now you're moving into Ohio Pound. There's a short, a short, yeah, short section there between the takeout and the put in for the lower yawk that you're not supposed to float. Um, if you're there in the summertime, you'll see everybody hanging out on the rocks alongside the river. It's a common place to hang out. People who fish there, you can catch fish right around there. It's where the, the bridge crosses there, the gap crosses there. But right below there is a considerable waterfall. In the past, from what I know is, I think they only allowed it once a year for people to go off there. White water experience, white water people. Now I think you can go up there anytime but I could be completely wrong but if you're into white water and you're pretty good at it something to check out if you haven't already done it I'm sure it's an adrenaline kick a lot of uh, white water guys and girls have done or would love to do all right so from there we enter the infamous lower yawk why I call this the infamous lower yawk that is the big time white water section that everybody's used to doing I did it once when I was younger, I was just in my late teens maybe, went with a large group. Um, that was when we didn't even need guides. We actually rented boats and did our own guide trip down. We had a gang of, we probably had about four or five boats of mostly <laughs> mostly teenagers and high school kids and, and a few adults that led us. Uh, I think the only bike to, or boat that wiped out was ours. We got hung up, there was a a set of rapids or like an S turn and we come down and went sideways into a big rock and yeah half the boat got dumped into the river um, but yeah that's where the infamous white water is we're looking at class two pr class threes and fours they got some class fours in there it's, uh, the biggest ones um, it's very popular in the summertime as far as white water rafting in the area from there you go down to um, Bruner Takeout. Now Bruner Takeout Bruner Takeout is the bottom end of the what they call the bottom end of the lower yawk. Really it's just I don't know there's a creek there or something and there's actually a takeout there and they don't it's one of a few areas they were probably able to put a road in and that's where they made the takeout. Um, there's limited parking there and it's basically you need to have permits to go in and out of there to pick up and drop off boats. You get a a permit from the park service I believe because again that's where all the guide services go in and out of there to pick up their rafters coming off the river as far as parking goes there is some sort of parking way up on top of the hill I think um, but I don't think you're gonna be doing the whitewater so don't worry about that now let's talk a little bit about the section of river below that and that runs from Bruner take out to Connellsville this is some pristine area in the sense that nobody really floats it because it's difficult to get to. A, to put in a Bruner, you got a lot of logistics to work with. Let's put it that way. And then, then to take out, at the end, Connellsville is a little bit of a challenge in that you get down there to a low head dam. Now, the... The actual ramp in Connellsville sits below that dam, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
But there might be a section somewhere right above there, but I'm not sure if it's private property or not. You'd have to do some research on that if you were to do it. Now, you could easily ride your bike along the gap, and which I've done, but I've never fished from the gap. Um, I'll, I'll put some pictures in here of what you could see and expect. I've heard stories. I know. I believe I know of some people who have floated it, <clears throat> and it is some exceptional fish fishing. There's still there's a lot of big trout in that section, as well as some nice smallmouth fishing. Um, but it's one of those sections that just doesn't get touched. I have to look into that more. I would be. It would be awesome if logistically we could coordinate with some people and do it. Um, I don't know if the outfitters I mentioned earlier do it it's possible that they do I, I think it'd be worth calling them and find out um, and possibly maybe I'll reach out to them um, yeah so that's that section I don't even know what they call it there's no real name to it I mean the, the names that, that are normally coined with the auk are lower to middle and the upper and that's all because they have guide service rafting on them and so that's why they have certain names tagged to them now when you get to Connellsville this is where wreck boating, when I say wreck boating, leisurely boating, when you're like, you're in canoes, you're in just good old Walmart kayaks, you know, your plastic kayaks, and, at, and even tubes. I've seen people going to, the water gets pretty calm from Connellsville all the way to where it meets Monongahela in McKeesport. Lots of opportunities here to fish, to float, to hang out on the river, just it, it, it it's a very nice section of river all the way around. You're going to hit some rapids in there, but nothing. Maybe a class one somewhere in there. I know of a chute that, I don't know if it would be a class two or not, but I, most of that water is riffles. At, at best, it's it's slow, flat water, and um, you'll hit some riffles and, and maybe a class one if the water's high enough. Um, you know what? Mentioning that, I skipped over something here. Let me talk about that before we get too deep into talking about that. When you're floating moving water, there's a few things you should always remember. One, try to float with somebody. Um, knock on one. I'm guilty of it, I've, but I've, I have a fair amount of experience. I've floated a few times by myself in the sense that I've done single access. You put in, you probably drag your boat up river or so forth. Um, but they're very, very, very calm pieces of water that are easily manageable. Normally, when you're moving on your own moving water, especially you don't know or you're not very familiar with, you should be floating at least with another person. It's all about safety. Safety is key when it comes to floating on rivers. It's, it, anytime you're on the water, safety is important, but on rivers most notably. If you don't know it very well, go with somebody that does know that section of the river. Or go to a guide service. Don't be ashamed to go pay somebody to, to take you down a river for the first time to, for you to understand and get used to it. They've been on that river multiple times. They know it. They know what to expect. They know where the challenges are. They know where the dangers are. So don't be afraid to look into an outfitter to do that. Also on a river, wear your PFD. Now... I fish kayak tournaments. We required on every tournament. Even when I'm wreck boating, I wear my PFD. Granted, depending on the state you live in, there's different laws. I know in Pennsylvania here from sometimes spring, I don't know, it might be, I think it's till October, May to October, April, or something like that. You're only required to have a PFD in the boat. You don't have to have it on, but I can tell you this much. You fall out of the boat, you don't know where that PFD You get The boat's going one way, you're going another way. There's no way you're getting a PFD in the boat. You're not. And you're on your own, and you better be able to swim, and, and you don't know what you're going to run into. With a PFD, you're on. If you're in, normally if you fall out of the boat, you're probably already in some rougher water. You're in some sort of rapid or something that it caught you by surprise. You got hung, hung up on a rock and it threw you out of the boat. <clears throat> PFD, you get your PFD, you grab it, you get your feet up out of the water because if you try to stand up, you're getting pushed over. Hey, that's where people run into a lot of dangers. So it's always safer to wear your PFD. Uh, it, every time we see uh, boating desks, 
I know at least in this area it's normally on a river and you're not wearing a PFD. So it's your choice. You want to live dangerously? That's up to you. The other thing, know your laws of the state. Wherever you're floating, you have different requirements, Pennsylvania, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, wherever you're at, all across the country, all across the world, know your, know your laws and obey them. I know at least here in Pennsylvania is one of the oddest states. But, uh, maybe they're just looking for money. But on our kayaks, you have to have at a minimum what they call a launch permit. A boat, or like a, it's just a little sticker. You pay about twenty some bucks for a two-year sticker, just to, just a way to say, hey, it helps support ra ramp access, river access, so forth. I think I don't know if there's any other states. Maybe Ohio. I thought there might be one other state. No other state requires this. Now, if you put a motor on your kayak, and then you need to turn it into a full-fledged boat, register it, put lights on, it, and so forth. That's a whole other story. I'm not there yet. The other thing to pay attention to when you're on a river, water levels and weather. Hey, when you're when you're on a lake, you could easily paddle out so far and come right back. When you're on a river, you're stuck. You're it, you're you're. It's tough enough to go back to your starting point, but you're on that river until you take out. Um, a river flow could be somewhere from three to four miles, or it could be up to eight to ten miles. If you're in the middle of that, and next thing you know, a bunch of uh, thunderstorms roll in, you're you're going to be hanging out for a while until they move out. So be aware that know how long it will take you to float a section of river in comparison to any potential weather that's rolling in. Also, study your water levels beforehand. Um, I'll put links in here to national. Uh, don't ask me. It's a geological. I don't even know who it is, but it's a thing. You can go on there, and they have monitoring sites almost on every river. And you can go there and click to see the current water levels, and you can even look at the history. And you can, from that, you can pretty much gauge where good water level is compared to historical. Because you'll see super spikes where a big storm comes in, even a hurricane. A couple of days, that water will go up above flood stage and everything else. And, again, you know, talk to local people who are familiar with the river, they'll tell you, hey, if you float it, if so-and-so gauge is at one and a half feet, you're good to go. Um, so that that's, those are things I needed to talk about probably up front, but I want to make sure I touch on them. All right, let's get back to Connellsville to McKeesport. Uh, this is one section of river that I'm most familiar with because I've floated it multiple times fishing. Um, and I think I may even did like a tubing trip on it once. I'm not sure, but it is a good set of section of river. Let's talk about some possible floats here. Um, oh, as far as the fishing goes here, good fishing. Lots of smallmouth. I caught my first ever citation on the Yawk River on in this area. Um, I know of people catching 20-inch smallmouth. There's some big ones in there. Now, on average, you're probably going to catch a lot of your 12 to 14s. There's a there's a fair amount of 15 to 18 inch fish in there as well. Um, but catching a citation, definitely pat yourself on the back. It's river holds them, and they're in there, and it's a good place to go to target them. All right, let's talk about possible floats. Um, again, if you're doing this for the first time. And you're looking for somebody to help you or guide you or, or float. Um, the one place we've used, me and my wife, we've done a couple times. We went down there in the middle of summer, take a day off work. Got beautiful weather. We go to Hazel Bakers there in Layton. And an interesting thing about Layton is while you're there, you can see the house from, what's his name, Wild Bill or whatever, from the movie um, Silence of the Lambs. The guy that was the serial killer, I think, that's where his house is. It's located in Layton. I actually put up a little map here where you can see Hazel Bakers in the, in the house. They actually mark it on Google Maps. So a little interesting history point there. Um, but Hazel Bakers, they, do, they will do, you can rent kayaks off them, or they will shuttle you with your own kayaks. Um, they don't start real early, so if you want to be on the river at the break of dawn, you probably have to float yourself. But you can get them as a guide service. They're nice and convenient. 
not real expensive. Um, they do get pretty busy in the summer, so be, be sure to book ahead. All right, so possible floats for you. Um, like I said, the top end you could put in at Connellsville. Uh, from Connellsville, you could float downstream. Now, you could do a single access from Connellsville, but you're going to drag up to that little low head dam, but you're going to be dragging your kayak. I've done that once. It was good to do for a tournament. I'm not sure I'd do it again. It was a bit of a challenge. It didn't pay off like we had hoped it would. Um, I did hook into one nice one I lost. Otherwise, I did catch my five fish limit. It was a slow fishing day. I think I even caught a trout in there. Uh, that's the air cool thing, float in the yaw. I know last year we did a couple tournaments on there. There was some, they float, they, they, I know West Newton, around the West Newton area, they stock a lot of trout. I was seeing golden, or what we used to call palominos, you know, they're, they're like a gold, white, yellow trout. I was seeing them everywhere. They're, you can't, they're hard to miss. I mean, so, uh, I was seeing them everywhere. So, your first float, possible float would be to Connellsville down to Dawson. Um, there's two takeouts in Dawson. One of them is private. It's Hazel Baker's. The second one is at the bottom end of the town, the downstream end of town. Um, there's some parking there. I think there's an old bar or something. I know we've used that before. Your next option would be Dawson to Periopolis. Again, you get down there, you're going to hit Layton, which is where Hazel Baker's is. You go past the Layton Bridge. And then Periopolis is actually a town that sits up away from the river. But down, they call Periopolis, the takeout sits along the river. It's, it's sort of an obscure takeout, honestly. There's some dirt parking there you can park at. And then there's a little bit of a pull-off there. You can unload or, or load up. And then right there, you drag up into the... the the takeout from the river. <coughs> Fro, so uh, we get below Periopolis. We can go Periopolis from there down to a section they call Smithton Beach. A uh, good bit of parking there. It gets very crowded in the summer, I can tell you that, between boaters and bikers. There's a good bit of parking, but you, it, it's pretty. Uh, Smithton Beach isn't. It's a pretty, it's a nice slow stretch right in that area. Now, right before you get there, there's a decent rapid that comes underneath the bridge there. Um, just got to pick your, your, you know, your lane there, and you should be okay getting through that. So you can come down there. You come to Smithton Beach. You could possibly go beyond that. There is Cedar Creek Park. Cedar Creek Park, though, has a, it is a public park. They gate it at night. They have camping there for people who are riding the Gap. I don't know if you could camp there. You'd have to call. If you were doing an overnight trip on the Yawk, it's possible you could camp there as well. Cedar Creek is just a couple, a mile or two past. I'm going to say a mile, mile and a half past Smithton Beach. Um, but that you could float to there if you wanted to. There's a ton of parking in Cedar Creek. It's a big, it's a big park. Um, or you can launch from there. Whether you go from Smithton Beach or Cedar Creek, next option is going down to West Newton itself. And this is where I'm going to stop talking because this is the furthest I've floated. All those floats there are nice floats. Um, if you're good to float, you know, make a day of it. Um, you know, I know, like I said, me and my wife go... Water in the summertime is normally low. It's clear we floated it. I could say this much. We have floated it when it's dirty. It's up in a little, what we call chocolate milk. Um, chocolate milk basically looks like, yeah, like, I don't know if you could see this cup here, but it is, yeah, it's brown. It, it, it literally looks like chocolate milk. Um, you're fishing on those days isn't the best. Um, a perfect fishing day on a river is probably the water's up a little bit and it's cloudy. If it's low and clear, it's tough. The fish are spooky. It's one thing, like I said, if you're going to float any of these sections of river, especially on a weekend in the summer, you want to go ahead and get on them early because you get the wreck boaters and people are just floating down through there. The fish are going to get spooked. There's a lot of activity there going to get spooked. Um... What else are they going to say? 
But otherwise, yeah, when the water even is when it's low and clear in the summertime, if you are wreck boating, it's fun to float. It's great. You just keep pulling over. Make sure you pack a lunch. Pack, take a cooler with you. Um, we had a laugh the other year. We did it. There were these two ladies. They were loaded. They had. They were literally. They floated down in tubes. They must be locals, probably. They were floating in tubes. They had a third tube filled with a cooler. I mean, they were having a good day of it. But if you're gonna do it, you, your wife, your spouse, your husband, your family, make a day of it. Make a point to float so far, pack a lunch, pull over anytime you want, get out of the kayak, cool off in the river. It's a blast. It's a very good place to float. Um, the water, when it does get clear, it, it, it looks beautiful on that river. It really does. Um, what else? I'm going to wrap it up there. I hope you found this helpful. Remember some of them safety tips I touched on in the beginning. I will put all kind of links in the description on on the different guide services, Hazel Bakers, Laurel Highlands Guide Services, the rafting companies in Ohio Pile, um, the other things. These here, these maps I have here, I'm lucky enough to get them in printed form. I don't know if you can find these anymore, but I got these. But if you go on to the mountain, what is their name? Let me see if I can find it here. Oh. Mountain Watershed website. They are a watershed group, a nonprofit group who try to protect them, do things for the Yawk. Um, you go on their website, they have these maps on the website that you can actually view. And I'll put views of them or uh, a link of that in there. Another good one is, again, uh, Purple Lizard. I'll mention them all. Every time. It, if you go somewhere and they have a map for it, it's worth getting. It's a few bucks, but the nice thing about these is they're waterproof. They're pretty tough. This covers the Laurel Highlands and Ohio Pile itself. And in these, you'll find stuff on the river, but you'll find hiking trails, biking trails, points of interest, vistas, waterfalls, anything worth seeing outdoor related. It's in that map. It's really cool. So I'll put a link of that in the description. And um, yeah. All right. With that, I'm going to wrap it up. I need to keep these videos a little shorter so they're easier for you to digest. If you have any questions, post them in the comments. Um, otherwise, I appreciate it if you like the video, you subscribe, hit the little bell, the notification bell when we put another one up, and uh, look to see you on the river. All right, guys. Take care. We'll see you out there. Have a good one.